Today on Paranormal Insights, we're going to take a look at our universe and is it real or a holographic simulation? And we have a viewer question from Katrina Petras who would like to know where she'll be 10 years from now. And we go to the UFO conference in San Jose, California to see Henry Drew and talk about a crashed UFO. Joseph Ernest Martin. I'm Angela Lynn Gibson. And this is Paranormal Insights, where we bring you the latest and best from the metaphysical world. Here, you'll get real tools and insights to your questions as we bring you answers from beyond the ordinary. Angela is an intuitive medium and metaphysical educator. She is the host of Transpersonal Radio, exploring parapsychology, spirituality, and how our thoughts upload our reality. Joseph is an award-winning psychic of over 25 years and is the author of the international bestseller, The Quest to Row, and recipient of the Visionary Award of Excellence. Well, you know, the whole idea of a holographic universe is really kind of fun. And, you know, we, we tape a show in the studio and it's often out of sequence. And so our little show taping universe is actually like a holographic universe. But the more I watch science talk about this topic, and even great philosophers talk about this topic, the more I realize, you know, our idea about reality being real can sometimes be really kind of tenuous at best. Well, it, is, it you know, and then it comes down to the very idea of what is real. We get into the, you know, our dreams we real. Or is our waking state real? Now we go down the rabbit hole further and we say, is the universe real? Or is it just a simulation of a prime or originating universe? And when we have experiences here on the earth plane, ones we would consider real because there's maybe actual evidence, you know, left behind that we've done something, the memory of that event can be like a dream. You know, recently I just went on a trip to New York City. And when I was there, we had a wonderful time. We went all these different places. We saw all these great things. But when I got back, it was as though that was a dream. And so the idea of a real reality becomes both yin and yang. It becomes both real and unreal, I think, depending on our perspective of what we want to carry forward from that experience. Someone asked me if I knew the truth, to which I replied, which truth? As compelling as the question is, does it really matter if our lives on earth are real or projections? Would you live your life any differently if the question were resolved? Life is short, and most of us are trying to bring as much meaning to it as we can within the time we have. For some people, family is everything. Others are driven to achieve wealth, success, and fame, or to make some lasting mark on our world. Some of us spend our lives striving for spiritual enlightenment, self-knowledge, or world change. There are people called to many number of different paths, like warrior, teacher, or artist. And according to the Michael Handbook, A Channeled System for Self-Understanding, none of these paths are better than any of the others. So does it really matter why we're here? Consider the answer Mahatma Gandhi said, whatever you do will be insignificant, but it is very important that you do it. And you bring up a great point because there becomes this whole concept, even in religion or in spirit, spirituality, are we our own creators? So do we worship just one deity, one God, one source, one creator, or are we ourselves creators? And this whole concept of the universe being multiple simulations means we are all gods, we are all creators of that particular simulation. And some philosophers, I think, even state today that we're moving toward this whole new kind of realm of creation or self-creation. You know, uh, it has been said by some that when Jesus came onto the planet, it was to introduce a new idea, that the, the original idea was an eye and a, for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. So if you stole my goat, I stole, steal your goat. Or if you killed my dog, I kill your dog. Then Jesus came along and said, no, no, we don't need that paradigm anymore. We can just simply have forgiveness change the world, right? But very radical concept at the time. And now we're entering a brand new radical concept into our little reality, which is, I don't need to forgive you because I'm either creating this reality or co-creating the environment of this experience. And creating that means that I'm responsible for the outcome. The scientific community has been abuzz the last several years about the idea 
there is a prime or originating universe that has since spawned countless simulated universes. Any advanced civilization would want to make a simulation of their universe to understand that universe better. Currently, there is a group of scientists who are exploring the hypothesis that we are actually living in our own SimCity, a computer simulated universe. Physicists have already managed to simulate tiny corners of the cosmos, and the simulation is essentially indistinguishable from the real thing. Physicists working with the theory of lattice quantum chromodynamics are considering that the possibility of our entire cosmos could be running on a vastly powerful computer. Greg Braden states, just as we can run a simulated program that looks and feels real, studies suggest that the universe itself may be the output of a huge and ancient simulation, a computer program that began long ago. If so, then to know the program's code is to know the rules of reality itself. Dr. Seth Lloyd of MIT in his book Programming the Universe, a quantum computer scientist takes on the cosmos, says that the universe is simply a large quantum computer that is computing itself. Nick Bostrom, a Swedish philosopher, posits that if we are not living in a simulation, then only two other things may be true. One, technological computing power is limited by some physical universal principle, and we can never really simulate reality with high enough resolution to be convincing. Or two, any such potential simulation creator beings wielding such advanced technology always decide not to create such a simulation. Others postulate we are indeed in a simulation, but that the simulation has evolved directly from consciousness without the need of a computer. The operation of consciousness allows for a potential change of eventualities. Recognition of that potential led to the simulation of the physical universe through a complex series of experimenting and evolving over eons. If we did discover today that we are in fact living in a computer simulation rather than our prior perceived reality, there are sure to be those who suffer from an existential crisis. However, most of our day-to-day -day interactions would be just as real as they were before the revelation of our newly defined reality. Being in a simulation would make our lives no more or no less important to one another. Science, technology, and medicine will most likely continue to function as though re the revelation had never occurred. Or the realization that we are in a simulation may encourage finding ways to hack the simulation by finding flaws in the programming and manipulating that code, disrupting or even destroying the simulation. From a religious or spiritual viewpoint, news that we are nothing more than a computer simulation raises questions about the concept of a person's soul or spirit and what actually happens upon death. Rather than a soul reincarnating after death of a physical body, perhaps some computer code responds that particular consciousness through a reboot. Or perhaps when we die, there is some trace of us left behind on a hard drive somewhere outside a matrix. If there are deities, beings, or programmers controlling our universe, we have no way of knowing what they expect or desire of us, or if we even matter to them at all. Responsible. And if you're going to take the number one position in any kind of situation, then you have to be 100% responsible for everything. So just like anyone else in the real world, when something goes wrong, you know, I'd go to my teachers and I'd whine or complain about it and say something. And they would say immediately, what could you have done, Joseph, so that that would not have happened? And at first, I felt a little bit insulted by that. You know, like, why is it all my fault? But then I started to realize, if you have high attention about the reality you want to create, then your attention is about every facet of that reality. And that means you can get the results that you actually want from situations if you're willing to do the work. That's absolutely right. And I think it's really important to consider whether we are a simulation from computer coding or whether we are a simulation from consciousness evolving, that means that we get to debug the program. <laughs> we need to debug the program. We need to check our thought processes. We need to check the coding that we're using. If we are not getting the results that we desire, we need to go back and recheck what's happening and we need to fix that.
And we're in a process of upgrading the program, don't you think, Absolutely. these days? Absolutely. We're in a period of change. Yes. Times are changing. Astrological things are changing. And if you are going to make the change, it helps to be very conscious. Now, a lot of the young souls in America, and America is a young soul country, hands mm -hmm. down, are going to really resist this because they really want someone external to blame. Mm -hmm. But that's why these kind of concepts are very revolutionary because if we are creating this, and I believe we are going to have like a Maitreya our savior, our philosopher, or guru appear in a very big mass way within our lifetime still, that is going to say or, or spearhead the change of creation, creation of reality, creation of our reality. And I believe that that is what's really going to save the planet because we're going to give up this notion that we need a Santa Claus or an outside being or influence to save us. We're going to realize if there is saving to be done, we're going to have to save ourselves. That's exactly right. It falls on us whether we look to one particular master coder. There is an entire team involved, and that team is responsible for the outcome of our reality. And so if you were actually going to make a change, what you might start consider doing is just make a change in your language, the words you use. Just start there, it's so easy. And what you're gonna find is not only is your life gonna change, but the reality you live in and the people around you are gonna change too. And now we're off to the UFO conference in San Jose to speak with Henry Drew about a UFO crash. <laughs> I am so excited today because I'm here with Harry Drew and Harry is an author and a researcher and has a new video called Terminal Approach about the Kingman UFO crash and this event is right up there with Roswell, the Aztec crash and of course Kingman. Kingman. Now this happened back in 1953 but the information that has come up about this event is absolutely amazing. Harry? It is amazing. It is amazing. Yep. How did you get involved with this crash event? I live in Kingman, Arizona. Well, that's and one I am a historian and I had to find out for myself was there or was there not ever a Kingman crash and meaning I didn't believe one way or the other. That was important and I began a professional investigation like I do with all of the work that I have done as a professional in history for the last 40 years. And not only did I find, one, that there was a crash, there were two UFOs involved. One landed and one crashed four days apart in May of 1953. And it confirmed for me by finding these sites, which I have stood on, and I'm the first person back after 60 years after the Air Force left. And this confirms one other thing that's very important. Without the Kingman UFO, there would be no Area 51 story because the reverse engineering that was done with the UFO at Area 51 was the Kingman craft. Well, some people, you know, you know, we're watching this. We're, we've been involved. We've been involved yeah. in the UFO community for a while. And someone might think, okay, 1953, that is a little while ago. But you're saying that this event is why Area 51 was actually established or created? Area 51, uh, which is an extension of Edwards Air Force Base, and this craft was taken to Groom Lake, and the second craft, which was beat up from being in a wreck, it had a wreck, and the total, complete, and unharmed UFO was taken to what is S4 at the Area 51 site, and used by our government and our military for all the reverse engineering that we're doing. So you're saying that our government got this craft, oh, yeah. one of them that was undamaged and was able to reverse engineer? Yep. Okay, so some people say if you gave Christopher Columbus a nuclear sub, there's not a lot he could reverse engineer. That The whole <laughs> technology is way beyond the capability of the people looking at it. Right. Was that true in this case or was the government able to actually get reverse engineering in a real way for us? No, they really could because they had, we were far enough along in our own technology. And I would like to mention, if I can, 
there was a four-member crew and each one of these craft, the first one that landed, all the crew were fine. And so you're saying real living occupants. Living it's not just the uh, uh, saucer or the crash saucer, but you're saying aliens. real aliens real were aliens. also yes. taken to Groom Lake. Groom Lake. I was told by one of the Air Force recovery team, the late Colonel Wendell Stevens, that uh, no matter what anybody tells you, don't let anybody talk you into the idea that they were taken to Wright Patterson. Wright Patterson Air Force Base in Ohio. They were taken to Groom Lake, and I can recall very clearly him telling me about seeing them because he was at the, cra at the landing site within two hours of it happening. And with a team from the Air Force who specialized in recovering UFOs. And he said, upon seeing the crew, they were human, and he was stunned. They didn't have suckers on their fingers like in the 1953 War of the Worlds movie, that type Fake of thing. Magazine from the but movies. what he meant by that was they were humanoid and their eyes were slightly further apart, but not the large like we see. And like I can see right over here at this great event that's going on. Well, uh, people have heard yes. of the Greys. We've seen the Greys in yep. uh, TV. We've seen the Greys in books and uh, Whitley Strieber's book, uh, Communion. Yeah. But yeah. you're saying that these occupants in the Kingman crash yeah. were very humanoid. Yes, they were. Yeah. It, now, um, after all of the years that have passed, and it's been 60 years, it makes me wonder if, in fact, they're like hybrids. Yes. So your feeling is they could yeah. be hybrids, part yeah. alien, part human. Absolutely. I had In never... 1953. Yes. Yeah. They are ahead of us, obviously. And But it struck me when it was described to me with great emotion uh, by one of the actual recovery team uh, that they were human, that maybe we were talking about hybrids. <laughs> and, uh, and just openly talked. Instead of uh, no telepathy, no telepathy, just, just with a voice, with vocal with a, cords, with a voice. At least they believe that that's what happened, and maybe they were meant to believe that's what happened. But that's what he thinks happened. Have we? Have you ever discovered what some of this communication was? Uh, actually, yes, and it, it had to do with there was a tone being admitted by the craft that was making the other air force, all of the air force personnel. And what I mean by that is human was making them sick uh, and giving them a bad headache. And um, they weren't able to actually approach the craft without getting so sick they had to get away from it. That sounds like a good defense perimeter. You can admit a tone around your craft to keep people or the animals away. Better than a burglar alarm. <laughs> yes, definitely. And so the crew was cooperative. And they were, uh, when I say they, the Air Force was worried. They allowed the crew back on the craft, and they disarmed whatever this was, and then they and then they left the Groom Lake. Well, Harry, you have done so much work in this research and creating this incredible video, Terminal Approach. I want people to be able to find it, get a copy of this. How can they find you? Uh, you can reach me at www.kingmanufocrashes.com. See what I found. I have two sites, six years worth of research and field work, and it's unbelievable. Six years of research on this DVD. Yep. It is fascinating, and I hope you take a moment to get the DVD, take a look at this information that Harry Drew has compiled for you and the world to see what really happened. Harry, it has been such a pleasure to talk to you today. My pleasure, thank you. UFO conferences here on the West Coast really does a great job, but it's one of a few UFO conferences that are actually really wonderful. And they bring people like Henry Drew forward to bring their research, to bring their experience and what they found. And one of the things I really liked about that is that he has so much information to share. And I can't wait to hear more about it because we are inundated at all turns with Roswell and Area 51 and it's so wonderful and refreshing to hear something new, a different perspective. And if you'd like to know more about the UFO conferences on the West Coast or anything that we've mentioned here about this show, please send us an email because we'll let you know these shows are so important. If you've not been to one, you've got to attend.
And now we have a viewer question from Katrina about what's going to be happening in her future. My question is, I was wondering where I'll be in 10 years from now. Katrina, good question. All about where you're going to be in 10 years. I've asked your guides to come in. I've asked my guides to come in. And let's see what they have to say about where you are going to be 10 years from now. Now that's actually a really long time, you know. 10 years, a lot can happen in 10 years, especially these days. So the first thing what I want to tell you is you are naturally a very powerful person, a very happy person. You have a lot going on. You have a lot of growth. And this next 10 year period is going to represent a period of personal and spiritual growth for you. And so this isn't just going to be about like getting a job and working and, you know, you know, taking the steps up. It's going to really be about who you are and how you feel and what's going on internally for you. You know, I have to say you are a lovely person and you are so sensitive. And so you working on issues of how not to be thrown by emotions or thrown by other people's junk or drama is gonna be really important because you are so sensitive and you really, really do care. And so I wanna say, I'm so sorry for you about that. That's only gonna make it harder. No, it's really good that you care, I'm glad. Being passionate over this period of time is going to be very good for you. And so you really have to decide what you want, what you want for yourself, where you want to go, what you want to achieve. You're going to find that the more passionate you are in how you go forward, the better things are going to be turning out. Now, here's, here's kind of the kickers I see it. Now, you're asking, like, where am I going to be in 10 years? And your guides aren't saying you're going to be in Nevada or you're going to be in Texas. They're not talking like that. Your guides, as I'm interpreting it, are actually saying to you, this period of time is about growth so that you will be firmly on your life path 10 years from now. Now, the only obstacle I'm seeing that would be in your way would actually just be you. So it's not outside stuff or people or situations. It's actually you interfering with your own growth. So I want to remind you that you're going to have lots of opportunity. Remember that. People are going to love you. Believe that that is true. Allow yourself to take the time necessary during this period of time to really center yourself where you need to be in order to be spiritually balanced, emotionally balanced, physically balanced. Now, you will be going forward in a very strong way, but I feel you're not going to be really hitting your stride in your lifetime until about 10 years from now. And that this period of time for you is all about interpersonal change, interpersonal growth, knowledge, acquiring knowledge, and feeling your way on where you actually want to be. I don't believe you're actually set yet on where you want to be in your future. So your guides are telling me, allow this period of time and this period of growth to be your impetus of self-discovery so that 10 years from now, you are the one creating your reality, making things happen, and feeling on top of the world because that's where I think you're going to be in 10 years from now. Hi Katrina, I really love your question about where you're going to be 10 years from now. Of course that's an open-ended question because 10 years is a really, really long time. But we're going to take a look here and see what the cards have to say and see what your spirit guides have to say as they communicate with my spirit guides. One of the things that you need to keep in mind is that you are always the master and the creator of your reality. So while we can check in with the cards to see what's happening, you always need to keep in mind that the decisions you make have a direct impact on where you're going to be. One of the things that I want to address immediately is it would be a lot easier, of course, with the month and day of your year, but the year 2024, which is 10 years from now, is the number eight, which is a highly, uh, it's a year of empowerment. And that's a year that you're going to step into your empowerment, which is really important. One of the things that you're dealing with right now is you happen to be dealing with not really feeling certain about where you want to be. You're carrying a lot of burden. You're carrying a lot of weight. And you're kind of not really happy with where you are in your life, hence asking where you're going to be 10 years from now. One of the things that I see here in your cards is that you're really going to be victorious once you decide the path that you choose. You are what I see enrolling in university. You're going to be taking some kind of classes to decide on. A, one of the things you have to decide is what field you're going to go into. And then you're going to be taking classes to further your education. 
When you do that, you're going to be a little bit uncomfortable because there's going to be some student loan debt most likely. You don't have the money saved up to go to school. But it's showing here that you would be very, very fulfilled if you decide to do that and move forward with sort of choosing something to empower yourself a little bit more. You're feeling like you're not living up to your potential, you're feeling like you're a little bit stagnant, and you're feeling like, you know, there's more out there, there's more for you, and that's true. Again, you are the master of your universe, so you get to create what that is. I would really strongly encourage you to not really say, uh, right now I'm playing the blame game, saying, well, you know, it's everybody else's fault because of this, everybody else's fault because of that. Look internally, decide what it is that you can do, what changes you can make, what are the different steps that you can take, including the people that you're hanging around with right now, because if you're not hanging around with people who are lifting you up, but instead hanging around with people who are bringing you down, obviously that needs to change because that's holding you back. So moving forward of where you're gonna be 10 years from now, once you decide the path that you want to take and you enroll in those educational classes, you are going to find things that are going to be moving forward very, very quickly for you. And you're going to find that you really hit your stride. The really important thing to do is keep balance in your life so that it doesn't become just all about school and all about homework. Make sure you maintain your social relationships. Make sure you maintain all of the interactions that are important in your life. Take time to have fun and enjoy life. And don't always worry so much about what the future brings, but live in the moment because that is what really counts. The moment is the future. We really appreciate your question, Katrina, although it was quite a challenging one because 10 years is quite a ways out there. And you have to remember, you are the creator of your universe. So the decisions you make decide the outcome of your future. And you know, that's true for all of us. And so even though divination is supposed to tell you your future, what it tells you is the direction your future is going. Yes. Because what you do actually will create your own reality. And we've been really fortunate because here at Paranormal Insights, we were just recognized by the Western Access Video Excellence Awards. We won the finalist award for Best Show Special Audience. And we would like to thank them for their recognition, but more importantly, we'd like to thank all our viewers who have made this so worthwhile. Thank you so much, and we're gonna to continue to work very hard, and who knows, we might even be winning more awards very soon. We want to answer your questions and address your topics. If you have a question that you want answered or a topic you'd like us to look into, we are easy to find. For private one-on-one -on -one psychic sessions or your personal questions on love, health, or money, you can find your answers by calling 510-387-3328. Or you can find me at my website, questtarot.com, or email me at joseph at questtarot.com. For one-on-one -on -one intuitive counseling, sessions for your personal questions about relationships, career, or life purpose, you can call me at 916-952-7212 or find me at my website, AngelaLynnGibson.com or email me at Angela at AngelaLynnGibson.com. You can follow us on Facebook, Vimeo, and YouTube. Simply search Joseph Ernest Martin, Angela Lynn Gibson, or Paranormal Insights. And be sure to watch our series, The Magic Minute, exclusively on YouTube where you'll find easy to use magical techniques to improve your life because it only takes a moment to make magic. And when you watch, remember to click like or subscribe after viewing the video. Please send us your questions and topics. So we can share our paranormal insights. And answers from beyond the ordinary.